بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد الحمد لله Welcome to the beginning of our syllabus titled the Inkpot Syllabus and as advertised we mentioned that this is a syllabus which has been designed in a systematic manner to allow a beginner student of knowledge learn the religion of Islam by leveling up through learning the different uh, books, starting with the basic books and then moving on to the higher books, inshallah, so that he becomes a strong student of knowledge and he has uh, a solid foundations when it comes to the knowledge of his religion. And there is a video on the Masjid YouTube channel, short five minute video, answering a number of questions regarding the syllabus. So anyone wants more information, they can go back to that video, inshallah. As for what we are doing today, then this course comes under the Islamic concept of Talibul Ilm, seeking knowledge. And seeking knowledge is something which has highly been emphasized within the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. In fact, the first word revealed to the Prophet was Iqra, read. Now, from all of the possible commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have given the Prophet from worshipping him alone, warning from shirk, praying his salah, giving his zakah. From all of the commandments, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to command the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and he said to him, Iqara, read. Showing that the Muslims, they are ummatu iqara, a nation of reading, a nation of research, a nation of critical thinking, not a nation of wasting time, blind following, or just following on culture, but rather, it is a nation of, of knowledge. And even the Prophet ﷺ, later on in the Quran, in Surah Taha, he was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah said, وَقُرْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا And say, O Muhammad, make this dua. The Prophet ﷺ was commanded to make this dua. رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا O my Lord, increase me in my knowledge. And this is the Prophet ﷺ who said, أَنَا أَعْلَمُكُمْ بِاللَّهِ I am the most knowledgeable of all of you regarding Allah. So if the Prophet ﷺ is being commanded to ask for an increase in knowledge, then what about ignorant people like you and I? And on top of that, this is the only ayah in the Qur'an where the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to make a dua for an increase in something. Many times Allah said, make this dua, make this dua, and so on. But the only place in the Qur'an where the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to ask for more of something, the ulama mentioned that it was this place here regarding knowledge. So the issue of seeking knowledge and learning about Islam is something which is highly, uh, uh, is, is highly encouraged in Islam, in the Quran, and likewise in the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, "Man yuridillahu bi khayran yufaqihu fi din. Whomsoever Allah wants good for, He will give him the understanding of the religion. Meaning, a sign that Allah wants good for you is that He gives you understanding of the religion." And this hadith has the opposite understanding. Just as if Allah wants good for you, He gives you understanding of the religion. If Allah doesn't want good for you, He doesn't give you understanding of the religion. And what we mean by understanding of the religion, understanding the Quran and the Sunnah, not understanding culture, what somebody said, but rather what is in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And likewise, there are many more ahadith. And that's why Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he said, لَيْسَ بَعْدَ الْفَرَائِضِ أَفْضَلُ مِنْ طَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ there's no action after the obligatory actions better than seeking knowledge. The best action that a person can do after doing that which is obligatory upon him from his salah, from his zakah, from being good to his parents and so on, the best action that a person can do is to learn about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah, he says in the introduction of his book Al-Majmu' اِتَّفَقَ جَمَاعَاتُ salaf Groups of the salaf have all agreed that busying yourself with knowledge is better than busying yourself with busying yourself with the recommended acts from salah, fasting and so on now, if you had a choice which, which is better to learn about Allah's religion and what he said in the Quran and what the Prophet ﷺ came with or to fast a day so groups of the salaf have all said seeking knowledge is better because a person, through learning about Allah, uh, through learning the religion, learns about Allah, and he learns about the Prophet 
And then he learns how to correctly worship Allah. And then he becomes a means of guiding others also. And there are many other uh, benefits. And you'll find the ulama, rahimahumullah, throughout their whole lives, they dedicated decades just to learn about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until even on their deathbeds they were learning. Ibn Malik, rahimahullah, he memorized five lines of poetry on his deathbed. Five lines of poetry he memorized on his deathbed. Imam al mufassirin Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, he's known to be the Imam when it comes to tafsir. Anyone who came after him is dependent upon his tafsir. He was the first one to write a whole tafsir of the Quran. He passed away in the 4th century. Even Ibn Kathir and others, you'll find, they always quote him. Ibn Jarir said this, Imam al-Tabari said this, and so on. He was on his deathbed, and somebody mentioned something to him that he didn't know. So he asked for a pen and paper, and he started to write it down. And he said to him, الحالة, In this state, you, you want to write down? And he said, It's befitting for a person to never leave off learning and seeking knowledge until he passes away. And that's why Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, when he was old in age, and he was seen walking around with pens and paper, you know, just as you might see a youngster walking around with his backpack, Imam Ahmad is basically doing the same thing. So the people said to him, how long are you going to seek knowledge? Like, look how old you are, you're white beard, fragile, you're still seeking knowledge. How long are you going to seek knowledge? And he said his famous words, which we, where we, this is where we've taken the title from. He said, From the ink pot to the grave. I mean, as soon as I'm able to write, I'm going to start learning. All the way until I pass away and enter my, my grave. So alhamdulillah, what we are doing today, and also on Thursdays, in these lessons, and also Saturday, for those who are attending the Arabic classes, we are doing one of the best actions that a person can do, which is learning about their, their religion. And there is an article that I wrote, and I sent it into the group today as well. Regarding, or your title, From the Inkpot to the Grave, which is regarding the importance of seeking knowledge. So if anybody wants more information regarding that, you can read the article, uh, Allah, and we might even give it out maybe uh, next week. Um, Insha'Allah. Now that we've established and acknowledged the importance of learning about Islam, learning the religion, the question, the second question, the first question was why? Why should we learn? Right? And we've basically answered that question. The second question now is how do we learn? How do we learn? Everything in life has a path, has a way. Whether it's something physical or tangible. You want to go from here to Mecca, for example. There's a way of getting there. Right? You want to go from here, from this masjid back home. There's a way of getting there. Or if you want to attain, I don't know, a certain job, there's a way of getting there by getting certain degrees and then work experience and references, whatever the case may be. Likewise, when it comes to seeking knowledge, there's a way. There's a methodology. There's a path. Now where do we get that path from? Where do we learn what that path is so that we can also go on that path and reach our destination, reach our goal, our objective? Just like if you wanted to get somewhere, who would you ask? You would ask somebody who knows. Somebody, if you want to go to Mecca, now it's a bit easy. Obviously you have waves, uh, waves and you have, you have Google Maps and wherever it is, right? Uh, so it's a bit easier now, but especially back in the day, right? If they wanted to get somewhere, somebody wanted to go to Mecca, who would you ask? Somebody who's never been, or are you going to ask somebody who's been? You can ask somebody who's been, and you tell you, go this way, don't go this way, this way is shorter, this way uh, is cheaper, and whatever other details he, he will mention. So likewise, when it comes to seeking knowledge, there's a path, there's a way that we have to take. Otherwise, if you don't take that correct path, what happens? We're not going to reach our objective. Or even if we do reach our objective... We're going to reach after such a long time and after putting in so much effort and becoming tired when there's no need to. You know, for example, for example, right? If I said to somebody in that cabinet over there, get me one of those books. The path would be is you get up, you walk straight there, you get me the book and you come back, right? If somebody now decides, you know, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go through this door here. Then I'm going to go through that room. Go out the, the exit over there. Go all the way around. Come back through that entrance and then go get it. And then go back the same way and then give it to me like this, right? Okay, I've got the book. I've got the book at the end of the story, right? But how much effort has he put in and time he just wasted, which he didn't need to? 
Likewise, if a person doesn't take the correct path when it comes to seeking knowledge, he'll end up wasting his time. Just like that. I know the example I gave was quite a straightforward example. But the analogy or the lesson which we can take is something which a lot of people only realize a decade later. And when they realize, they regret. They said, oh, if only I took the correct way of learning. Because they find after a decade, they're in the same, exact same place they were five years ago, six years ago. They're not really progressed. So we have to look at the people who have already tread this path of seeking knowledge. And who are the people who have already treaded this path? They are the ulama, the scholars. So we have to look at the scholars and we ask them, okay, how do we seek knowledge? And the scholars have put in a lot of effort to teaching us not only the religion, but also teaching us how to seek knowledge and how to learn. And when you look into their lives as well, you'll find that all of them had a methodology in learning. They memorized the Quran first, and then they learned from the scholars in their area. Then after that, they traveled. All of them have a similar path and a similar way of learning. It wasn't the first book all of them studied was Sahih Bukhari. No, there was all of them had a path, right? So they took that path and they reached those high levels. And likewise, they have explained to us that path. And we should, if you want to reach that same level, we have to follow them in that path. What is this path? This path is what we call Adabu Talib al the etiquettes of a student of knowledge. The etiquettes of a student of knowledge. Now, when you hear etiquettes, a lot of people think or the understanding of the etiquettes of a student of knowledge is quite limited and they think. By the way, everyone should be writing, by the way. I'm going to test you guys. Right? Everyone should be writing this down. Okay. I'll probably mention how many hadiths, about seven, eight hadiths, and a few other points. If I was to test you right now, it's only been 10 minutes. Would you be able to repeat any of those hadiths? The, the, the points I mentioned regarding seeking knowledge is in the article. You can, you can go back to that, inshallah. But make sure you guys write all the points that I mentioned. For those that haven't attended my lessons before, in the beginning of every single lesson, I test the students. And if you don't answer, I don't teach that day. I've done that before. At least you'll get up and I go. Why? Because what's the point of me teaching you? It's going to forget. Right? So you have to be writing. And you have to be revising as well. And alhamdulillah, Zuhur, uh, sorry, Asr from tomorrow is at 6.45. Right? 6.45, Asr tomorrow. By the time you finish 6.55, that means you have 20 minutes. Or Thursday lesson. You have 20 minutes until the lesson to revise as well. So you should be revising at home. If you can't, at least come for Asr, you have 20 minutes after that to revise as well. Okay? So make sure you're writing and you're revising, inshallah. Now, so as, as I was saying, the meaning of the word etiquette, people have a very limited or a narrow understanding of it. And they think etiquette is just basically smiling at someone and be, being nice to them, which is a part of it without any doubt. And it's a sunnah. But it's not restricted to just that. When we say the etiquette of a student of knowledge, it's referring to the whole methodology of a student of knowledge. And this can be seen in six points. right? Any of the etiquette that we talk about, they'll come under one of these six points. Okay? And even these six, six points, we'll take it again in our Thursday book. Shaykh Haytham Sarhan is explaining Surah Thalatha after Hadith Jibreel. He mentions these six points. And, and he titles it, The Six Rights of a Student of Knowledge. He titles it, The Six Rights of a Student of Knowledge. So if I ask you, I might say to you, what are the six rights of a student of knowledge? Or I might even ask you the meaning of the word etiquettes. In etiquettes of a student of knowledge, what does that entail? Then the answer would be the following six points that I'm going to mention. The first is the first right is a right upon himself. A right upon himself. And I'll explain them, so just write them down for now, inshallah. The second is a right upon his teachers. Or a right not upon, a right for his teachers. No, for his teachers, better word. So right for him, right for himself, right for his teachers. The third is a right for the place where he is studying. The place where he is studying. The fourth is the rights for his classmates. 
for his classmates. The fifth, for his books. And the sixth, for the knowledge itself. The knowledge itself. So we have rights for himself, for his teachers, for the place where he is studying, for his classmates, for the books and the knowledge itself. Okay? Now all of these, I'm not going to explain all of them in detail because they're going to come throughout this book. And likewise, in one of the Thursday lessons will come as well. But any of the points that we mention when it comes to ethical of student knowledge will come under this. How should a person act with the knowledge that he has learned? For example, one of the rights of the knowledge that he has learned is that he acts upon that knowledge. Okay? With his teachers, there's a way of speaking to their teacher and so on. With his classmates, there's a way of interacting with the classmates. With the books, for example, you don't put books on the floor. Right? You place them on a desk or somewhere else, not somewhere where your feet are also treading and so on. So all of the ethics that we will learn in this book, inshallah, and also in the future books, will come under one of these six principles, or one of these six uh, rights. And these etiquettes of a student of knowledge, the ulama, rahimahumullah, they have written a lot of books regarding it. I'm going to mention to you three books. I mean, the books are many, right? And I could literally, uh, before the lesson, I, I tried to search uh, like a list of books, and I got like a hundred books. Right? And if I mention 100, it's just going to go over your head. So I'm going to mention three books, inshallah. Three books. And these three books, inshallah, I also plan to teach as well. So the next issue which I want you to write down is some of the books which talk about the ethics of a student of knowledge. Some of the books that talk about the ethics of a student of knowledge. The first book is called Ta'zim al-Ilm. Ta'zim al-Ilm, which translates to Glorifying knowledge. Glorifying knowledge. And that's the book that we are studying today, inshallah. Ta'azim al-ilm. Glorifying knowledge. The second is Hilyatu Talib al-ilm. Hilyatu Talib al-ilm. Hilyatu Talib al-ilm literally means the beautification of a student of knowledge. However, the English translation which I saw, they've titled it, The Ethics of a Student of Knowledge. The word hilya literally means beautification, zina. Okay, but I, just, I think just to make it a more generic and easier title for the English audience, they've translated it to The Etiquettes of a Student of Knowledge. And that's by Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid. That's by Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid. And the third book is Tadhkiratu Sami' Wal Mutakallim. تَذْكِرَةُ السَّامِعِ وَالْمُتَكَلِّمِ I mean, there's a longer name to it, but this is just the main part that you need. تَذْكِرَةُ السَّامِعِ وَالْمُتَكَلِّمِ It translates, it is in English. Uh, the translation is something along the lines of the reminder for the listener and the speaker. The reminder for the listener and the speaker. And then the, the rest of it is فِي أَدَبِ الْعَالِمُ الْمُتَعَلِّمِ in regards to the reminder for the listener and the speaker, in regards to the etiquettes of the t teacher and the student. In regards to the etiquettes of the teacher and the student. So that would be the whole name. I think it's a yellow colored book. You can find that in English. Tazkirat al sami al Mutakallim. And if you want the whole name, Tazkirat al sami al Mutakallim fi adab al alim wal mutaallim. Fi adab al alim wal mutaallim. These are just three books, right? The books are many more, right? But for now, you guys should know at least three books, and inshallah, later on, even in the book that we're going to study, a few of the books are going to be mentioned, Isharat Tullah, Ta'alim and Muta'alim, and so on, and then maybe you can add them on, um, inshallah. Before we actually study the book, and we start the book, there is something which I wanted to uh, mention as an introduction to the book, which is something very important, inshallah, which is the importance or the virtues of etiquettes, and the virtues of manners. Now, alhamdulillah, in the group today, I sent a PDF and also we've printed them out as well. If anybody wants, a, if anyone needs a copy, put your hand up, inshallah, I'll pass it down to them. Yeah, give me one as well. Okay, 
Now, when we're talking about the importance of etiquette, we're going to split the importance or this topic into two. The importance of mannerisms and etiquette generally, that's the first one. And then we're going to talk about the importance of etiquette specifically for a student of knowledge. Specifically for a student of, of knowledge. What? What? So alhamdulillah, I've made it easy for you guys. You don't have to write. Literally everything is written on, uh, on this paper. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the importance of etiquettes and mannerisms generally for every single Muslim. Right? What we're going to mention here is for every single Muslim, not for a scholar or just, just a scholar or just a student, but for every, every Muslim. Right? And in these couple of pages, there are eight virtues of, of good manners. You know, a person ponders over these ayat and these ahadith that we have mentioned, then it sh really shows the importance of how, how much importance the religion has given to mannerisms. Right? And it's not something which a person can brush off. For example, some people want to talk about aqeedah, aqeedah, which is very important, and that's the, you know, one of the first books we're studying. But if you look at books of aqeedah, like Shaykh al-Islam's Wasatiyah, right at the end, he has a whole section of mannerisms. Why? Because mannerisms are a part of a person's belief. And we're going to take some hadith that prove that as well. Likewise, Imam al-Albani, rahimahullah, he said, I used to think the issue with the Muslims was aqeedah. But now I've realized it's aqeedah and manas. Right? So, manner is something very important, and let's read uh, this document, inshallah, so they can cl further clarify the importance of uh, good manners and etiquettes and so on. The first point is that good manners are a means of entering Jannah. They are a means of entering Jannah. And in the hadith of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at the end of the hadith, he says, وَبِبَيْتٍ fi a'la al-jannah," That I promise a house in the highest part of paradise, for who? For the man who has perfected his moral character, i.e. his mannerisms. For the person who has perfected his mannerisms, his etiquettes. What's the reward of that person? Not only does he enter Jannah, the Prophet says in this hadith, he'll have a house in the highest parts of, of Jannah. And likewise in the hadith after that, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, what are the main causes to enter people into paradise? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Taqwa Allah wa husnul khuluq. Having the taqwa of Allah and having good mannerisms. That, these two are from the greatest factors which allow somebody to enter into paradise. So that's the first point. The second point, good mannerisms are a way to achieve the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you can see here there are a couple of ayat mentioned. For example, in the first ayat, the end, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْزِنِينَ Verily, Allah loves the good doers. The next one, وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الصَّابِرِينَ Allah loves the patient. And being patient, being good to others, and so on. These are from good manners. So Allah loves these people. Likewise, in a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, which is a lot more clearer to the point that we are making, the Prophet wasallam said, أَحَبُّ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا The most beloved slaves of Allah to Allah are the ones who are the best in, in manners. So if you want to be loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then a person has to perfect his his mannerisms. Number three, good mannerisms are a way of, or from the ways of attaining the love of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not only of Allah, but also the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inna min ahabbikum ilayya wa akrabikum minni majlisan yom al qiyamah wa hasinukum akhlaqa." Verily, the most beloved of you and the closest of you to me on the day of judgment are whom? Are the ones who have the best. Best mannerisms. On the next page, the we turn over. Number four, honorable mannerisms is the heaviest things, heaviest thing on the scales on the day of judgment. The Prophet sallallahu said, "Ma min shayin fil mizani athqal min husn al khulq, min husn al There is nothing more heavier on the scales than good manners. Heaviest thing on the scales. Where we're gonna on one side we're gonna have our good deeds, on the other side our bad deeds. We want our good deeds to outweigh our bad deeds, don't we, right? So what's the heaviest thing that we can put on there? Good manners. Number five, good manners multiply the reward. 
The Prophet said, إِنَّ رَجُلَ لَيُدْرِكْ بِحُسْنِ خُلُقِهِ دَرَجَاتِ قَائِمِ اللَّيْلِ صَائِمِ النَّهَارِ That person, he reaches the levels of the one who is standing the night and fasting throughout the day by doing what? By good manners. If he has good manners, he reaches the same level as the one who prays throughout the night and he fasts throughout the day. Point number six, good mannerisms is from the greatest acts that a slave can come with. From the greatest actions that a slave can do. The Prophet وسلم, he said to Abu Dhar radiallahu an, that should I not inform you of two things which are the easiest to do but the heaviest on the day of judgment. And one of the, and the Prophet said, عَلَيْكَ بِحُسْنِ الْخُلُقِ وَطُولِ الصمت. That is upon you to have good mannerisms and to remain silent for long periods of time. Why staying silent for long periods of time? So that you don't end up saying something, something wrong. Number seven, good mannerisms increases one's lifespan and populates an area. The Prophet ﷺ said, good mannerisms and good dealings both populate an area and they both increase one's lifespan. And number eight, good mannerisms is an indication for the completion of Iman. And this point is very important. And this refers back to the point which I mentioned before. How from a person's Iman and connected to his Aqeedah is his Akhlaq. What does the Prophet ﷺ say? أَكْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا That the believers who are the most complete in their Iman, those that have the highest level of Iman, those who are complete in Iman, أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا Those that have the best mannerisms. Meaning if you have bad mannerisms, your Iman is not complete. Your Iman cannot be complete. In another hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was asked, Ayyu al-Imani afdal, which is the best form of Iman? And the Prophet said, Husn khuluq Good, good mannerisms. So here are eight points. Eight points, and inshallah, I don't expect, you know, if you can, Allah barak, it's very good if you can memorize all eight points with all the proofs, but at least minimum of three points you guys should come with, prepared for, next lesson, inshallah. So this is the first point regarding good mannerisms and etiquettes, which is their importance and their virtues generally for every single Muslim. Generally for every single Muslim. As for the second point, which is the importance of good mannerisms, specifically for a student of knowledge. Now this is the next point. The importance of good mannerisms specifically for a student of, of knowledge. Maybe the greatest point for me anyway, is a statement of Yusuf ibn al-Hussein, rahimahullah. Yusuf ibn al-Hussein, he says, بِالْأَدَبِ تَفْهَمُ الْعِلْمِ Through these etiquettes, you will understand knowledge. بِالْأَدَبِ تَفْهَمُ الْعِلْمِ Through etiquettes, you will understand knowledge. You know, we, talk, we, we want to learn knowledge, we want to attain knowledge, we want to become knowledgeable. Uh, what does Yusuf ibn al-Hussein, what does he say? He says, that how do you attain that knowledge? Through implementing these, these etiquettes. So don't think these etiquettes are something which are extra, something which the ulama have just put there and just they're being strict for no reason. No. It's, it, it allows you to actually, if a person abides by them properly, he actually attains more knowledge. And we're going to explain some of the ways that happens through as we're explaining the book. And this is why you'll find from the time of the Salah, from the Sahaba, from the Tabi'un, and their students, the first thing that they would learn before anything else would be, would be mannerisms. That's why, what's the first book that we are studying in this course? The book of mannerisms. Because that's what the Salaf would do. Ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, he says, كَانُوا يَتَعَلَّمُونَ الْهَدِي كَمَا يَتَعَلَّمُونَ الْعِلْمِ They used to, they used to, i.e. the Salaf, the Sahaba and Tabi'een. They used to learn guidance, i.e. etiquettes, before they would learn, or, or sorry, كَمَا يَتَعَلَّمُونَ الْعِلْمِ Just as they would learn knowledge. They would learn etiquettes just as they would learn knowledge. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he saw a youngster from the Quraysh and he said to him, يَا بْنَ أَخِي O the son of my brother, تَعَلَّمِ الْأَدَبْ قَبْلَ أَنْ تَتَعَلَّمُ الْعِلْمِ Learn etiquettes before you learn knowledge. Learn etiquettes before you learn, you learn knowledge. And I mention one more statement, inshallah, which is regarding al Layth ibn Sa'd. Layth ibn Sa'd, from the great, greatest of scholars from the Salaf, 
he came across some of the students of hadith and he saw something that he didn't like he saw that they did not they were not upholding some of the etiquettes of a student of knowledge so he said to them what is this you people are more in need of a little bit of good manners than your need for a great deal of knowledge he said what is this you people are more in need of a little bit of mannerisms more than you are in need of a, of a lot of knowledge meaning you try and learn all this knowledge, you don't need all that knowledge right now. What you need right now is a little bit of, of etiquette, mannerisms. Then think about the knowledge. So you can see how much emphasis and importance a salaf would give to, to etiquette. And especially if a person is striving to be a person where he will be carrying the inheritance of the prophets, which is the knowledge, as the Prophet said. That the prophets, they never left behind wealth, but they left behind knowledge. That was their inheritance. Right? So a person is walking with the Quran in his heart, with the ahadith of the Prophet and his sunnah in his heart, then it's not befitting for him to have the etiquettes of the layman, people on the street. He can't be acting in the same way that they are acting. Rather, good mannerisms, as you said, is important for every single Muslim. But it's even more important for a person who wants to be a student of, of knowledge. Now, with that said, inshallah, we'll begin our book. And the book, there was a link when you guys signed up on the Google form. There was a link at the end. Some of you were able to order it and I think some of you missed the link as well. I did send it again today. If, uh, if you've not got the book today, no problem. Uh, inshallah, bring it in next week But it's important for you to have the book Why? Because I'm going to read through the book So that you can follow along You know what, what I'm talking about Where am I commenting Right? You need to have the book with you um, Inshallah And those online students as well um, The brother does uh, deliver internationally as well And if somebody is struggling financially Or is not able to get the book Then there's no PDF for the book However Obviously, the, the brother who's translated it, he does have his own PDF. And I spoke to him. And if anybody is not able to uh, get the book due to financial issues or whatever the case may be, he said, email them explaining your issue. And he, inshallah, he'll send you specifically the PDF with the condition that you're not allowed to send it out to anybody else. That way, nobody's prevented from seeking knowledge. But I think most people, inshallah, especially in the UK, are able to get the book. The discount as well, it works out to be the same as you know, a burger meal or something like that, right? It's like five pounds, four pounds, okay? And then uh, I'm probably guessing even after the lesson, there'll be some people planning to go get something to eat as well, right? Right, those laughing, <laughs> right? So, um, do buy the book so that you can follow along. Otherwise, honestly speaking, you'll be struggling if you uh, do not have the book uh, with you now. So, the book that we're studying before we read it, just to explain, this is called Khulasatu Ta'adhim al Ilm. What was the name of the book that I told you to write down the first book? When I, when I mentioned three books. Ta'azim al-ilm. Right, this one is called Khulasatu Ta'azim al-ilm. The summary. I.e., it's the exact same book, but this book here is a summary of that other book. So the, the book that you've written down is bigger than this book. And the book that you've written down, I've taught it before, I taught it in Manchester. Right, but I just saw that it's easier. Uh, and all of the main points are in this summary, so it'll be quicker for us to finish this book. Uh, inshallah. If anybody does want to read the bigger, the, the asal by themselves, that, that's fine. Inshallah. But we're going to go through the summary. And this book is written by Sheikh Salih al usaymi Hafizahullah, who's still alive. In fact, he's from, from one of the greatest scholars of our time, currently residing in Riyadh. And every year, normally, this year he didn't have it, but before that, for the past, I think, 11, 12 years, he used to have a yearly dora. In Al Masjid Nabawi in the winter. It was an eight day course, eight day dora. After Fajr for about four hours, then from Asr all the way until about 10 p.m. at night. And Asr there was about four o'clock. For eight days. And in those eight days, he would go through 15 books. And I remember when I was there my last year in Medina, there was about 6,000 students who had attended that dora. You know, people came from other countries, people came, uh, coaches came, uh, you know, people came from everywhere, everywhere, people from UK came, and so on. So Sheikh, Sheikh Salih al-Usaymi is from the, you know, major scholars of our time. And if you see anything from him, then 
cling on to it and benefit from him, inshallah. Anyways, he's written this book and he wrote the book Ta'adheem Al-Ilm and he summarized it himself. So the summary that we've got, he summarized it himself. And it's translated, I mean the book that we're using is translated by our brother Muhammad Abdul Razak, who is currently a master's student in Medina University. So the brother who's translated it, he's currently a uh, master's student in the Islamic University of, of Medina. What Shaykh Usaymi has done here is that he has not mentioned all of the ethics of a student of knowledge. There's many things that he has maybe missed out. But because it's the beginner's book, it's the first book, he's just mentioned the main points. And what he's done is that he's mentioned 20 points in here. 20 principles. Right? He's mentioned 20 principles in this book. There's a small introduction which we're going to read. And then after that, he's mentioned 20 principles. I.e., 20 principles from the etiquettes of a student of knowledge. And those 20 can be summarized into one of those, or they all go back to one of the six rights of a student of knowledge that we mentioned, that we mentioned earlier. Okay? So, without any delay, we'll read the book, inshallah. And what I need from you guys in this book, that when we read this book, is from each chapter, you need to know what the principle is. Okay, you need to know what the principle is. What is the ethical that he has mentioned? The explanation of it. Like, the, what is the meaning? What does it consist of? Right? And the proofs for it. So if he mentions the ayah, an ayah. Mentions the hadith, hadith. Minimum one. Just, just one. Okay? You don't, need to know more. you don't need to know more than that. So for example, one of the points, I think the second chapter, he will say, the principle is to be sincere. And he mentioned the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ what does it mean to be sincere? He mentions four points. Right? So I don't need you to memorize the whole chapter word by word. All I need is the principle is to be sincere. What does it mean to be sincere? Four points. One, two, three, four. The hadith, in al amal bin yat, actions are by the intentions. That's it. Okay, that's what I need. So how, how are you guys going to solidify and know this book inside out? By knowing the principles, the meaning of the principle, and a proof for that principles. And even once you finish this book, this is a book that you should be going over again and again and again because it's your foundation. All of the other books that you study, all of the other lessons that you attend, what are the things that you should be doing, what are the ethics that a student of knowledge should be up upholding, is what, you know, the basis of all of that are the points that he mentions in here. But like I said, obviously there's points that he's not mentioning here, but for a beginner, these are the most important points. So if you see another sheikh or another ustaz teaching this book, don't say to yourself, oh, I've studied the book. No. Go and st learn that book as well. Re-listen to it. Even if he doesn't say anything new, at least it's revision. And most likely, they will probably mention other benefits and keep benefiting from them. Right? Repeating, don't, don't ever think to yourself that, oh, I've studied this book, that's it, I've completed it. No. Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, when he was a judge in a dilam in Riyadh, he taught Usul al Thalatha, which is the book that we're going to study on Thursday. He taught it over a hundred times. That's Ibn Baz, the greatest of scholars in the past century. Right? He taught it over a hundred times when he was in Riyadh. It's, such a, it's a small book. I know kids in Mashanabi who memorize the book. It's a small book. But he taught it over a hundred times. He could turn around and say, look, I'm a great muhaddith. I should be teaching Bukhari, Muslim. Or that's my level. No, but he knows the importance of the, of the um, basic books. And what we mean by basic books, and this is actually an important point you should be writing down. These books that we're studying, they're known as in Arabic as mutun. They're known as mutun. Mutun literally means text. But what we are... Referring to, a better translation would be classical scholarly text, or scholarly text. No. Scholarly text. Scholarly text. And these scholarly texts are very important for us to focus on, right? Because this is how we're going to learn. The scholars have placed for us these texts so that we can learn solidify them and then move on to the next ones and move on to the next one and move on to the next one. That's how your knowledge about Islam is going to be a solid, it's going to have a solid foundation and you're going to be strong in your knowledge. Right? Whereas a person who just listens to a lecture here, a podcast here, a conference here, that's not knowledge. Right? That's like paracetamol where just for like a small period of time we have an imam boost and after that it's forgotten. Or if you listen to a lecture, it's like re opening up a book and re reading page 50. Right? Like you read the page 50, it sounds like a nice page, but you don't really know what's going on, you don't know what's before it, you don't know what's after it. Right? So, the way that you are going to solidify your knowledge when it comes to Islam is studying mutun. 
this scholarly text. And you'll find that not only in, within is the sciences of Islam is your knowledge going to be solidified, you'll find even outside, the way you think, the way you conduct yourself, you'll find a change in that. You'll find a change within that. And that's why you'll see a person who's been studying for a while, his conduct, if he's been studying correctly, is different to a person who's young and he's just started to study. Because when you study correctly, that has an effect not only on the person's knowledge, but in the way he thinks and also his, his conduct. So that's why studying these mutun are very um, important. Now, so we're going to start, inshallah, and we're going to read the introduction of the author, which is from page 12. If you've not got a book, then just try to share with someone next to you, inshallah. Everyone's got page 12, yeah? All right. The author, he says, may Allah preserve him. On page 12, all praise is due to Allah. I testify that none has the worship to be, none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is a slave and messenger. Peace and blessings be upon him, or upon his family, companions, as many as those who study and teach. Um, see, this is the issue with translation. Sometimes translation things are messed up. In the Arabic, the author starts off with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And that isn't, you can't see that in the English translation. But the author starts off with the, what we call the Basmalah. Basmalah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That's the name of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So he starts off with the Basmalah. Then, he, the second thing that he mentions is Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah is praising Allah. Hamd, inna alhamdulillah, nahmadu, alhamdulillah. You know, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he sends salah upon the Prophet wasallam, the third thing. And then also he sends it upon his family, his family and those who follow him. So these, these four things, the author has started off his book with four things. With the basmalah, with the hamdalah, sending salah and salam upon the Prophet wasallam, and also fourthly upon his followers and his companions and his family. These four things, these four things that the author has done, they are from the etiquettes of authorship by agreement of the scholars. They are from the etiquettes of authorship by the agreement of the scholars. Meaning, if a person wants to author a book, how should he start? He should always start with these four things. Which is, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And then praising Allah. Then sending salah and salam upon the Prophet ﷺ, And also upon his, uh, his family, his companions, and those who follow him. And the meaning of Bismillah ar-Rahim and Alhamdulillah and all of that is, you know, it's going to come in so many different books. So for today, we're not going to explain it. On Thursday's lesson, inshallah, uh, we'll, exp we'll explain it within Allah. So, the meaning of Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, these issues, because every book starts off with it, right? Inshallah, uh, the more we go through it, the more detail we mention for each one. What you need to know right now is that these four things, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah Sending Salah, Salam, salam upon the Prophet, and then upon his family and his followers, these four points are from the etiquettes of authorship by agreement of the scholars. And then the author, he says, to proceed. Which in Arabic is Amma Ba'd. You'll hear that a lot. Amma Ba'd. What does Amma Ba'd mean? Amma Ba'd in Arabic is an expression which is used when a person wants to change topic to another topic. So the author starts off by praising Allah and sending salah from the Prophet. Now he wants to move away from that topic and start talking about the book itself. So now because he wants to move topic, he says, in Arabic, they say, Amma Ba'd. They say, Amma Ba'd. And saying, Amma Ba'd, is a sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. In fact, Al-Hafiz Ibn Hajar, Rahimahullah, he quotes, or he mentions, that Abdul Qadir Al-Rahawi, Abdul Qadir Al-Rahawi mentions, that Amma Ba'd has been narrated from 32 companions of the Prophet Wasallam that the Prophet Wasallam used to say it. So he mentions, Abdul Qadir Al-Rahawi mentions, that 32 companions of the Prophet Wasallam narrated, that the Prophet ﷺ would say, Amma Ba'd. And that's why, in the khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ, what do we hear? In the khutbah, on Friday, what do we hear? After, inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasa. After that, Amma Ba'd. Fa inna astaqa al-hadithi. Or fa inna khayr al-hadithi. Right? Amma Ba'd. Why? Because you've moved away from the topic of praising Allah to now moving on. You're talking about the Quran, and you're going to talk about bid'ah, and so on. So that's why the author has used uh, Amma Ba'd because he's following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Then the author, he says, now this first paragraph that the author mentions, and also the beginning of the next paragraph, this is like the foundation of the book, or one of the most important things that the author has said. He, so ponder over what he says. I'll read it a bit slower, but ponder over what he says. He says, Indeed, the slave's portion of knowledge depends upon the, heart, uh, depends upon the heart's portion of glorifying knowledge. So the person whose heart has been filled with respecting and glorifying knowledge his heart becomes a befitting and suitable place for knowledge. And depending on how much decrease there is in the heart from glorifying it, then it is the slave's portion of knowledge up until you find some hearts not having any knowledge within them. So whoever magnifies knowledge, the light of knowledge will shine upon him. And the messengers and the tools of its fields come rushing to him. He does not have in his aspiration any goal except to seek it, nor in his own self any delight except to think about it. What the author basically says here is depending on how much glorification, veneration you have for knowledge, that's how much knowledge you will actually attain. If you, if you show importance to knowledge, you'll attain a lot of knowledge. If you don't have that glorification knowledge, that importance to, for knowledge, then you won't have much knowledge. And you only gain equivalent to how much Glorification of knowledge You are You are showing So what does that show us? You want to attain more knowledge? What do we have to do? We glorify knowledge We venerate knowledge Okay And we want to get to that stage Where the author he says in the second paragraph He does not have in his aspiration Any goal except to seek it Nor in his own self any delight Except to think about it What do we mean by venerating knowledge? It means you get to that stage The only thing you're thinking about is Is knowledge you're not wasting your time with football. You're not wasting your time with... You know, not saying that those things aren't allowed. But a person who truly venerates knowledge, the most beloved thing to him is, is learning. And if he tastes the sweetness of learning about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he doesn't think about football. He doesn't think about TV shows or movies or going out for a coffee. The only thing he thinks of is, is knowledge. And that's what Ibn Aqeen al-Hanbali, even he... He said that he was in his 80s He said I'm more eager to learn now And I'm in my 80s than I was when I was in my 20s And he mentions He says La It's not permissible for me to waste even an hour of my time If I'm not able to read Or to discuss Then I'll relax And I'll think about knowledge And when I get up I won't get up except That I know what, what to write That I'm th thinking about it That I get up Okay I know what to write No wasting any time you find people like Imam Nabi Rahimullah When he would have guests over While speaking to them Sharpen his pencils Right Just so later on He, he doesn't have to sharpen his pencils Somebody may think oh, oh, it Takes 10 seconds right Okay Or maybe in those days A bit longer Right But they Won't save any time that they have Even Imam Al-Bani Had the story of Imam Al-Bani Rahimullah Where he had his door handle In a certain way Right And for him to open it He'll have to open it And then move Take a step back And then it took him basically a few seconds longer. So he got his door handle changed. Why? Just so that he doesn't faff around with turning and go moving back. He changed it. Why? Just so he can save that minute or a few seconds that he would have spent when it came to. Uh, he can spend that time now on seeking knowledge. So when a person venerates knowledge, knowledge, that's the level he should aspire to get to. Right? The author carries on and he says, and it is as if Al-Hafidh Abu Muhammad Al-Darimi intended this meaning when he concluded the book of knowledge from his book Al-Mustan Al-Jami' with a chapter regarding glorifying knowledge. Uh, Imam Al-Darimi, he has a book, one of the most famous hadith books, Sunan Al-Darimi or Mustan Al-Darimi. Right in the end, he, finish, he finishes off, he's got a chapter just about knowledge. And the last chapter he has in there is I'azam Al-Ilm, glorifying knowledge. And Shaykh is saying he understood he understood what it means to glorify knowledge. That's why he placed that chapter within there. Right. So we've understood if you want to attain more knowledge, what do we do? We have to venerate knowledge. Right. Question now, how do we venerate knowledge? How do we get to that level where we start thinking like the ulama, rahimahullah, think? That's what the author now is answering in the next chapter. He says, the most helpful way in reaching a level of glorifying knowledge is to know the ways and points of magnifying it. And they are comprehensive principles that actualize the glorification of knowledge in the heart. So whoever takes these points becomes a glorifier of knowledge and a magnifier of it. 
and whosoever disregards them has wasted himself and followed his desires and he has no one to blame if he falls off seeking knowledge except his own self. What does that mean? How do we glorify knowledge? He's saying by acting on the principles, i.e. the etiquettes of, of, of seeking knowledge. To summarize what the author said here, how do we venerate knowledge? By acting upon and actualizing the etiquettes of a student of knowledge. Right? And then on the next page, page 14, he mentions some lines of poetry, Yadaka awkata wa fuka nafakh, which basically means um, it's regarding that if a person, he doesn't reach the high level, he's got no one to blame apart from himself. It's his own fault. It's not something impossible. You think the scholars of Islam before this were born as scholars? No. They, but they took the path of seeking knowledge, put effort in. Likewise, we can reach similar levels if we are also serious like them. And then the last couple of lines in this introduction, very powerful. And in, in uh, Arabic, sounds a lot more eloquent. Shaykh Usaymi, he says, وَمَنْ لَا يُكْرِمُ الْعِلْمِ لَا يُكْرِمُهُ الْعِلْمِ Whoever does not respect and honor knowledge, knowledge will not honor and respect him. Whoever does not respect and honor, honor knowledge, knowledge will not honor and respect, respect him. So, to summarize the introduction of the author, right? I'm gonna this is the question I'm gonna to say to you. Right, the author wrote an introduction. Summarize it. What was the point that he's making in his introduction? Basically, made two points. He said that you can only attain knowledge if you venerate and glorify knowledge. That's the first point. And the second point is, and you venerate and glorify knowledge through the etiquettes of a student of knowledge. And then, you know, in this book, the author, rahimahullah, he mentions 20 uh, principles, which are from the principles of, of seeking uh, knowledge. And the author has made it very summarized, right? Because, as we're going to talk about shortly, knowledge isn't just talking a lot, a lot of information. If the sheikh wanted to, the sheikh could have easily made the book massive, right? But then would anyone benefit? No one would benefit. Right? So Sheikh has done it very small. Why? Each principle you'll find. It's just a principle, the meaning, a quote, an ayah, a hadith, maybe a, one, one or two quotes of the scholars or maybe a story and that's it. And he moves on to the next one. Why? Because having a little which is beneficial is better than having a lot which just goes to waste. And these etiquettes, they're not something that have been made up by the scholars. But they are something which have been taken from the Qur'an and Sunnah, or they are branched from the Qur'an and Sunnah. So there are some people who will turn around and they will say to you that these etiquettes that the scholars have mentioned is extreme, we, we don't need it. But the reality is that that is not the case. Just as knowledge itself is something which comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like as a lot of these etiquettes stem from the same source, from the Qur'an and Sunnah. If not directly from an ayah or hadith, then from the general meanings of that. So some of the points that the uh, scholars mention might not be an exact hadith, but it's the meaning of general hadith. Right? And especially the points in this book, you'll find all of them have, a, have dalil. Every point that the Sheikh mentions, he'll mention an ayah for it, or he'll mention a hadith for it. So acting upon these etiquettes is you acting upon the Qur'an and Sunnah. That's why it's important for us, if we want to follow the Qur'an and Sunnah, is that we have to also act upon these uh, these etiquettes. What we'll do, inshallah, we'll try, we'll, st we'll take the first one today, inshallah. Uh, we've got a bit of time. The, le the time of the lessons will be approximately one hour, inshallah, each lesson. Sometimes we might go over, about 10 minutes, okay? Sometimes we might finish 10 minutes earlier. So there's no like exact time that, oh, it hits quarter past, we're gonna finish. Okay, just whenever we finish, as soon as we finish the first chapter, inshallah, we'll conclude the lesson there, bi'ithnillah. Right, so the first principle that Sheikh mentions is cleansing the vessel of knowledge. You know, if you, inshallah later we're going to study, we're going to study fiqh. We're going to study the, chapter, uh, the topic of fiqh. Fiqh is, you know, the rulings of praying salah, zakah, 
of buying and selling and so on, okay? The first thing that the scholars talk about, because the first pillar of Islam is the shahada, right? two shahadas, and that's, that's the science of aqidah. So after that we have salah. So the first thing the books of fiqh start off with is the rulings pertaining to salah. But what comes before salah, wudu, right? So just before talking about salah, they have a section on wudu. And then they have all of the other sections which kind of are connected to wudu. So literally the first chapter they have in most books is Babul Miyah, the chapter of water. Why? Because how do you do wudu with water, right? So they'll talk about water and the different types of water that you can use and uh, the waters that, you, that you're not allowed to use. Okay. Now water is a liquidy sub substance, right? It's not going to start floating in the air. You can't just do wudu from there. The water has to be placed somewhere, right? In a bucket, in a plate, wherever it is, in the sink, right? So that's why the second chapter in fiqh normally is Bab al Aniyah, the chapter of utensils. Why? Because the water has to be placed somewhere. So the ulama talk about which utensils are allowed, which utensils are not allowed, generally for wudu. And then they also, because that's the chapter, they talk about generally as well, which plates, which spoons uh, uh, Muslims are allowed to have, uh, not allowed to have, and so on. Similarly, knowledge. Knowledge has to be placed somewhere. When you attain knowledge, where, where, where is that knowledge placed? There's a vessel, there's a utensil that, that knowledge is placed in. And just as something, anything that you have which is expensive, precious, important, you're going to place it in an important place, in a safe place, in a precious place. You have jewelry, pearls, money. Where are you going to put it? Just throw it anywhere? Not going to put it anywhere, right? You're going to get a nice uh, box, and that's going to be an expensive box. Well, put it in there. Then where are you, where are you going to hide it? You know, you're not going to get jewelry and put it in, hide it in a shoe or something, right? Maybe something else you might have there, which is not as important. But when it comes to things which are really important and precious, you're going to put them in the most precious place um, you can, generally. So likewise, knowledge is placed somewhere. Wherever that knowledge is placed, that has to be a place which is clean and pure. So what is that place? Where is knowledge placed? The Sheikh, he says, over here. He says, number one, cleansing the vessel of knowledge. The vessel is the heart. So what's the vessel of knowledge? Where is knowledge placed? In the heart of a person. Then the Sheikh, he says, and depending on how clean the heart is, will knowledge enter. So the cleaner the heart is, the more knowledge it will be capable of taking. Now, to summarize what the Sheikh says in this paragraph, he is saying that the heart has two states. Either the heart is pure, and in that case, it will take in the knowledge. Or the heart is impure, or the heart is dirty. And if that is the case, then a person will only attain knowledge according to how dirty that, that heart is. So the more dirtier it is, the less knowledge that he will that he will attain. And when we're talking about knowledge, we are talking about a specific type of knowledge. We're talking about beneficial knowledge. We're talking about beneficial knowledge. And inshallah, at the end of the chapter, we'll talk about what's, what's the meaning of beneficial knowledge. The Shaykh, he carries on and he says, So whoever wants to acquire knowledge, then let him beautify his inner self. Let him cleanse his heart from impurities. For indeed, and at this point which is in bold, I read it in English, but Arabic is a lot more eloquent. He says, Knowledge is a delicate fine jewel. It does not befit except the clean, pure heart. In Arabic, فَالْعِلْمُ جَوْهَرُ latif لَا يَصْلُحُ إِلَّا لِلْقَلْبِ nazif." Knowledge is a precious jewel and it's not befitting to place that except in a clean heart. So we have to clean our hearts. If you want to benefit from knowledge, if you want to have beneficial knowledge, then we have to make sure that our hearts are, are, are cleansed and purified. Right. C clean and purified from what? From what things? Now that the, the Sheikh, he starts to explain and he says, the purification of the heart returns to two great foundations. The purification of the heart returns to two great foundations. Number one, <clears throat> being cleansed from the impurities of doubts. And number two, being cleansed from the impurities of, of desires. So what do we have to cleanse our hearts from? Doubts and desires. Doubts are knowledge-based. Those 
doubts are those desires which can lead a person to having you know, incorrect beliefs and maybe even leaving the religion. So if he doesn't clean himself and cleanse himself, purify himself from doubts, then that will corrupt his heart. And the other is desires, and this is action-based. If a person does not purify himself from these desires, then he will end up following his desires. And when we talk about desi- uh, doubts and desires, these can fall into the following things. It can be doubts and desires in shirk, which is the worst. Doubts and desires when it comes to shirk. This is the worst. Then doubts and desires regarding bid'ah, innovations. Things which the Prophet did not come with. And then major sins. And then major sins. And then minor sins. And then fourthly, minor sins. So we have to cleanse our hearts from both doubts and desires. And these doubts and desires can be in shirk, in innovations, in major sins, or in minor sins. Any of them. The worst being shirk. And so on in the order that we mentioned. Then the author, he says, if you, became, if you become shy of a creation similar to yourself looking at your dirty clothes, then be shy that Allah looks at your heart and within it is evil and rancor, sins and errors. This is very powerful what the Sheikh says. You know, if you have clothing and your clothes get dirty, you feel shy, right? To go on. If you, if you had a nice, let's say you bought a nice, fresh, white thobe and you get a pen mark on it. I know people that be standing in the bathroom one whole hour just trying to clean that pen, pen mark off. Right? Why? Because they feel embarrassed going against, uh, standing in front of somebody else with a dirty thobe. So if we are like that when it comes to other creation who are like us, then what about, why isn't it the fact that we are shy when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see our hearts? And also if you look at the next hadith, on the next page, the, sh- uh, the shaykh mentions the hadith. What's the proof that Allah looks at our hearts? Mention hadith in Sahih Muslim, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ صورِكُمْ وَأَمْوَالِكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't look at our outer appearance nor at our wealth. وَلَكِنْ يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ But He looks at your hearts and your, and your actions. He looks at your hearts and He looks at your actions. And the heart, the heart is, a, is the foundation. The actions are just a manifestation of what is in your heart. As in another hadith, famous hadith for Islam, Bukhari, a Muslim, Allah wa inna fil jasadi mudghah That is a morsel of flesh in the body. Iza saluhat, saluh al jasadu kullu. If that morsel of flesh is sound, then the rest of the body is sound. Wa iza fasadat, fasad al jasadu kullu. And if that is corrupt, then the rest of the body is corrupt. Allah wa hiya al qalb. It is the heart. So if you want your actions to be sound, then the heart has to be sound. If your actions are corrupt, then the reason for that would be, or one of the reasons would be, your heart being, being corrupt. And that's why, you know, it's very important. There's a famous ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says in the Quran, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ And on the day of judgment, nobody's wealth or children will help them and benefit them in any way, shape or form. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except for the one who comes with a sound heart. Now, why a sound heart? Because a sound heart, if, it, if the heart is sound, then the actions will also be sound. Right? And another point regarding this ayah is, an, is a way people understand this ayah. When people say you have to have a clean heart, a qalb salim, a sound heart, the, the explanation goes to, right, you shouldn't have jealousy, and all these other things, which without a doubt comes in the meaning of the ayah. But if you look at simple tafasir, like even look at even kathir, look at the, uh, when he quotes the salaf, many of them they explain qalb salim to be salim, yani mean a shirk. It's a sound out, i.e., sound from shirk, right? And if you look at all of the statements of the salaf, put them together, the meaning of a sound heart is, sa- is sound from all impurities, sound from all impurities. The greatest of them being shirk, the greatest of it being shirk. And then also from innovations and the major sins and minor sins and that includes being jealous of one another, having hatred and all these other things that people mention, it will come under this meaning. But there are things which are greater than that which is your heart being sound of from shirk and uh, innovations and major, major sins. And as uh, the Shaykh carries on, we'll finish. He says, 
So whoever purifies his heart, then knowledge settles upon it, and the one who does not remove his impurities, then knowledge leaves him and disperses. Sahal ibn Abdullah Tustari, he said, Haramun ala qalbin an yadkhulahu an nur, wa fihi shay'un mimma yakrahuhu Allahu azza wa jal. It is haram upon a heart for light to enter it, and within it is something that Allah dislikes. You know, how can the light of Allah enter into a person's heart when the heart is full of things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes? And the dalil for this from the Quran is an ayah in Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 14. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَأَصْرِفُ عَنْ آيَاتِيَ الَّذِينَ يَتَكَبَّرُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ We will divert away from our signs those that have arrogance. Arrogance is an illness of the heart. What does it mean that Allah will divert them away from his signs? Muhammad ibn Yusuf said, Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Faryabi, he said, أَمْنَعُ قُلُوبَهُمْ مِنَ التَّدَبُّرِ فِي أَمْرِ أي القرآن. I will prevent their hearts from pondering about the Qur'an. So Allah said, those people have this, the arrogance, Allah will prevent them from pondering over the Qur'an. Sufyan ibn Ayyina, he says in the tafsir of this ayah, أَيْ أَحْرِمُهُمْ فَهْمَ الْقُرْآنِ I will prevent them from understanding the Qur'an. And takabur, arrogance is one of the impurities of the hearts, and there are many others. So if we have these impurities in our hearts, then we will not benefit from the Qur'an or the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn al-Hajj, in his book Al-Madkhal, he mentions something. He says, and this is an answer to some questions that some of you might be thinking of. He says, وَمَعْلُومٌ أَنَّ بَعْضَ الْمُتَكَبِّرِينَ يَحْفَظُ الْقُرْآنِ It's known that some of the people who are arrogant, they do memorize the Qur'an. Now you might know someone that you think is quite arrogant, but he's memorized the Qur'an. So he says, وَمَعْلُومٌ أَنَّ بَعْضَ الْمُتَكَبِّرِينَ يَحْفَظُ الْقُرْآنِ It's known that some of those who have arrogance have memorized the Qur'an. وَلَكِنَّهُمْ مُنِعُوا فَائِدَتُهُ But they have been prevented from the benefit of the Qur'an. فِي الْفَهْمِ وَالْعَمَلِ When it comes to understanding the Qur'an and acting upon the Qur'an. وَذَلِكَ فَالْمَطْلُوبِ And that is the objective. That is the objective. And that's why we have a question which is, what is the objective of, of seeking knowledge? And this question, inshallah, will answer in the beginning of next lesson. Uh, so, you know, we've talked about why should we seek knowledge, how to seek knowledge. This is like the third question, which is, what is the objective of, of seeking knowledge? We'll stop here, inshallah. Uh, so we've taken the first principle, just something, last question, which we'll take in the beginning of next lesson. Um, so next Tuesday, inshallah, do try to order the book if you don't have it. But next Tuesday, inshallah, next Tuesday, inshallah, we're going to start off the first five, ten minutes with just me testing you guys on what we have taken. So I'll say to you, for example, I'll say, Safi, don't worry, let's get next week. No, 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 not today. Right, but I would say, Safi, tell me a virtue of seeking knowledge. And then I might say, Hasnan, tell me three ahadith or three proofs showing the importance of ethics generally. Then I might say, Awab, mention one of the statements of Salaf regarding the importance of ethics for a student of knowledge. Right? Then I might, say, I might say, Yusuf, tell me, summarize the introduction of the author. And then I might say, somebody else, okay, what was the first principle that the author mentioned? What's the proof for the... F I'm going to ask you all of it. So make sure you guys repeat. It's not, it's not difficult. Literally, you just need to read it one, one or two times. In fact, if you pray Asr and you just sit for 20 minutes properly, that should be enough, to be honest. Just to... I go over what we have taken. If you've written everything down, then that should be enough, inshallah. So, uh, every Tuesday, it's going to be this book. Thursday is a different book, inshallah. The Thursday book is explanation of Usul al-Thalatha. Now, the book for Usul al-Thalatha, uh, alhamdulillah, I have, I, have the, I have the books for that. So, inshallah, on Thursday, whoever comes on Thursday will give you a physical copy of the book. Some of you, we've already, I've, give, I've given it out to some of you before anyway. Uh, those who are online and can't come to the machine to collect it, I'll send a PDF into the group, inshallah. Uh, there are groups, so make sure everyone's in the WhatsApp group. And there's also a, also a Telegram group as well. Uh, and personally, I prefer Telegram because uh, anyone who comes in later, they can see the previous messages. If anything gets deleted, you can re-download it. Things like that. So try to, if you don't have Telegram, get Telegram as well. But if you just have WhatsApp, then that should suffice, um, inshallah. So, I'll see you all either on Thursday or if, you're, uh, if not, then uh, next Tuesday. Uh, Insha'Allah, subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, ilaha illa, astaghfiruka wa tawbiruka.